Good afternoon. The Bible says, whether there are two or three, gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst of them. And we're just thankful to God that we have this opportunity to come again and to share the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Uh, we know that afternoons can be uh, horrific for some uh, because we have eaten and we are assuming that position in our chairs that we want to sleep in the afternoon. So I'm going to do, try to do the best job that I can to keep you awake this afternoon as we proclaim the word of God. But nevertheless, it is good for us to be here. And we appreciate you being here on this afternoon. And we hope, trust, and pray that we can say and do some things that will have an eternal effect on our soul salvation. It's good to have all of the sister congregations who are here. Uh, good to have all the, the elders and deacons, brothers and sisters, and mothers and fathers. And again, happy Father's Day to all of the fathers. Uh, God has truly blessed all of the fathers. And we pray that God will continue to bless you as you be the type of men that God would have you to be and not the type of men that Hollywood wants you to be. I want to thank Brother Fleming and this congregation, the elders here, for uh, having the confidence in me to come this year and to share with you. And, and I'm indebted uh, to this congregation, to the membership here. And, and we pray that uh, we will do some things this week that will be long-lasting, uh, that will, will leave an impression on you, and not because of what I've done, but because of what the Lord has done. But it's because of his word, his word penetrates our hearts and changes us and causes us to be better soldiers in the future than we have been in the past. Let us go to God in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Father, which art in heaven, the Father of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we approach thy throne this evening with humility and thanksgiving in our hearts, realizing that you are an awesome God. We realize that you are the only God and beside you there is no other. And Father, we pray that as we study together on this afternoon, that we would realize that we have to take a step back and look at ourselves, examine ourselves and see whether we are truly contending for the faith. We realize the world that we live in. We realize this nation is going down a slippery slope. And Father, we pray that as members of your kingdom, that we will hold up the bloodstained banner of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say amen. amen. I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet I live with him forever and you know, yes, I live, live and glory by. I tell and sing, tell a story. There no more. I, oh, yes, I live, live and glory by. And by. I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8 on this afternoon as we study God's word together. Jeremiah chapter 8. And we're going to pick up in a few minutes at verse number 4. Jeremiah chapter 8. And we're going to pick up in a few minutes at verse number 4. We're going to ask you to, so we solicit your prayers for the Agers family who traveled with us on this weekend. And they've had a wonderful time. And again, we appreciate your hospitality. We appreciate your kindness and your generosity. And we certainly I appreciate all that you have done for us, and I know I'm speaking for the Agar family as well. They're going to be leaving us on tomorrow. I tried to twist their arm and convince them to stay just one more day. You know, if I could have convinced them to stay one more day, I could have convinced them to stay another day. <laughs> but they have to get back. But they have, I know, I speak for them, they have enjoyed themselves immensely. Uh, they've never been to the state of Kentucky. I said, oh, you know, everybody needs to go to Louisville. You know, you know before you die, you need to come to Louisville. So... Uh, but they, they have enjoyed themselves. We showed them around town and showed them the city, and, and they have really, really enjoyed themselves. We ask you to pray for them as they travel back to Charlotte on tomorrow. Now, Brother Campbell, one of our deacons uh, at university, he'll be here all week long, so you'll be seeing a face around and, and uh, just get a chance to know him. Just good, just wonderful, wonderful person, him and the other deacons and the elders there at university, just a wonderful group to work with. 
and we certainly appreciate him for taking the time off to come and to be with us on this week. Jeremiah chapter 8. You know, some people believe that our greatest need in America is jobs. And I don't want to minimize the fact that if you are sitting out in the audience and you are unemployed, I don't want to minimize that fact because everyone needs jobs. If you're looking for a job and looking for employment, people want to do things to support their families. So I'm not minimizing the fact that you don't have a job, but there are some people that believe that the greatest need in America is jobs. There are some other people who would tell you that our greatest need is political, that we should somehow heal the political divide that hinders our nation from moving to a solution for its problems. Our greatest problem as a nation is not the economy. Our greatest problem as a nation is not jobs or it's not political partisanship. Our greatest need in America is a return to the Lord and biblical principles. That's our greatest need in America. Returning to the Lord and biblical principles would be a swift solution that would result in immediate changes in every realm of American life. And I want to take us back to the nation of the final days of the nation of Judah. In Jeremiah chapter 8, there was a prophet, and you know who it is, a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. He had been sent to preach the word of the Lord. Judah, like America, refused to heed the word of God, and they were judged for their sins. And America, I want you to understand something this afternoon. America is headed toward the same end if it does not turn its back, or if it does not turn around and start serving the Lord again. And we live in a nation, brothers and sisters, that was founded upon biblical principles. When we research our history, we see that our nation, our very nation, was founded on biblical principles. So I want to use for a subject a nation that needs to return back to the Lord. A nation that needs to return back to the Lord. And I want you to take notes this afternoon. I want to shake you from your lethargy. I want to stir you up. I want to give you something to talk about and tell those that weren't here that missed it. I want to help us understand, my brothers and sisters, of the things that we have accepted as a society and we've sat back and done nothing about it. I want to look at Jeremiah chapter 8 and I want to examine the nation and their apostasy. In Jeremiah chapter 8, Brother Fleming, if you please, in Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse number 5, Excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse number 4. What does the Bible say? Read it if you have it, please. It said, moreover, you shall say to them, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, thus said the Lord. In other words, I've got something to tell you. Read. Will they fall? Will they fall rise? and not rise? Will one turn away? And Will not one return? turn away and not return? Read. Why has this people slid back? Why have they gone back? Why Jerusalem? are they not moving forward? Why are they not progressing? Why are they slidden back? Read. Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a perpetual back in a backsliding. perpetual backsliding. They Read. hold fast to deceit. They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. And they refuse to return. When we look at these two verses, the Lord, what he's doing, the Lord states his case against the nation of Judah. Now, y'all hang with me now. I'm going to be where you want me to be in just a minute. i got to lay my foundation, so just hang with me. The Lord states his case against the nation of Judah. They had been given the law of the Lord, but they refused to walk in the law of the Lord. In other words, God had told them what they needed to do, but they chose not to walk in what God told them to do. Brother Fleming, read verses 6 and verse 7. Read. I listen he and said, heard, I listen and heard, read. but they do not speak or write. I listen and heard, but they were talking all this gooby to God. They didn't speak the right things. Read the Bible. No man repented of his no wickedness. No man wanted to turn. No man wanted to repent of what he was doing. No man repented of his wickedness. Read. Saying, saying what have I done? What have I done? So like a child, you know, when we were children, when our parents, they came in and they asked what was going on and, and they got ready to chastise you, say, what have I done? What am I? What have I done? I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't done anything. And that's what's going on right here. They said, what 
have I done? Continue to read. Everyone turned to his own course. Everyone, the Bible said, turned to his own course. As read. the horse rushes into As the, the horse battle. rushes into battle, verse 7. Even the stork even in the heavens. Even the stork in the heavens. Knows her appointed time. Knows her appointed time. And the turtle dove. And the turtle dove. The swift. The swift. And the swallow. And the swallow. Observe the time. Observe the time. Of their coming. Of their coming. But my people. But my people. Do not know the they judgment They don't even of the know the judgment of the Lord. They lack the common sense of the animal kingdom. Even the animals know how to do what they were created to do. Yet the people of God, they seem unable to walk for God or live out his will in the world around them. They had abandoned God's ways for their own ways and God calls their behavior backsliding. He said they have backslidden, which means to turn away or to go off into apostasy. And apostasy means a totally abandoning God. And you have congregations right now in our brotherhood that are abandoning God oh, because they have right. no desire, no will, no, no want to, or not even a desire to do what God would have them to do. So they want to draw more folk by entertaining folk instead of doing what God would have them to do. So they're backsliding. They're doing all of this stuff trying to draw folk, but we need to realize that Jesus does the drawing. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I be, Jesus, I, I, that's what Jesus said, if I be lifted up. Folks need to stop lifting themselves up and start lifting up Jesus. That's where we need to get back to in the Lord's church. If we want to draw folk, lift up Jesus. My brothers and my sisters, the Lord said this was going to happen in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1. We know what the Bible said. We know exactly what it said. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. My brothers and sisters, however, I'm glad not every person in Judah was guilty of this kind of apostasy. You know why? In Elijah's day, in the northern kingdom of Israel, God gave the prophet Brother Fleming some encouraging news. When I read 1 Kings chapter 19, I'm going to read this one. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and in verse number 18, the Bible said, Yet I have left me 7,000, 7,000, 7,000 in Israel. We have what? Who have not, who have, I'm glad that we got some folk in here this evening who have not bowed down to Baal. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that we've got some that have not bowed down to Baal. But you know what? When I look at America, this is a clear picture of America this afternoon. We live in a nation right now which is headed down the moral elevator. You all know it. You just don't want to talk about it. Because we sit back in our houses and we watch our televisions and we say, well, you know, that doesn't affect me. Yes, it does affect you. It affects the Lord's church. It affects your family. And 20 years down the road, you're going to wish you had a said something about it. There are laws being passed which directly go against God's law. Consider where we are as a nation right now. Morally, we're heading down a slippery slope. Our government spends $200 million per year teaching a child how to use a condom. Your tax money. Your tax money. And we ought to be teaching abstinence. Fifty-six million Americans are suffering from a venereal disease of one form or another. Homosexuality and lesbianism and gay marriage have all become the mainstream in society. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. See, we just don't want to talk about it. But I'm going to talk about it because we need to build our hope in Jesus. We need to turn back to serving God, and we need to put our hope where it's supposed to be. We need to put it in Jesus Christ and stop allowing social media to change you, to turn you, to twist you, and to dangle with you and try to take you in and, make, and suck you in to believe all of this stuff that's going on in Hollywood. We are a nation right now. We are the most unchurched and biblical illiterate generation in the history of the United States of America. 73%, I want you to listen to this. I told you I was going to shake you up. 
73% of teenagers in our nation are experimenting with exotic witchcraft and religions and devil worship, and they can't even quote Genesis 1-1. Each week, our children and our families are bombarded with 48 hours of images from the media that directly stand opposed to God and disgrace everything that Christians believe. Drug and sex and immorality reign supreme in a nation right now to the extent where we are losing our identity and many Christians are losing their way. In our churches, some of our teens, they're more familiar with the lyrics of Justin Bieber, Jennifer Hudson, and CeeLo than they are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. You ask them to sing some lyrics or some joke on the outside, they've got it on their iPod and they can sing it. But if you ask them to sing the lyrics of, oh, how I love Jesus, they don't even know all of the words. This nation is in a deplorable condition. The Bible, the light of the word and prayer have been removed from our schools. The Supreme Court has decided that the Ten Commandments cannot be displayed on our, in our courthouses. And some people actually fear that the Ten Commandments believe that they might pose a danger to some child who might read it. But you know what? I would rather take my chances with someone who has been exposed to the Bible, prayer, and the Ten Commandments than someone who has been taught that there is no such thing as right and wrong. Whether we like it or not, brothers and sisters, we might as well face the truth that America right now is turning into a heathenistic nation. And that's why we need to return back to Jesus and on biblical principles and put our hope where it belongs or back where it belongs, and that's in Jesus Christ. We're going to go back to Jeremiah chapter 8, if you please. Jeremiah chapter 8, having defined their sin, this nation, we're going to look at their abomination. Having defined their sin and spoken to their spiritual condition, God speaks to the people of Judah to confront them on a very personal level. He admonishes them concerning some very important areas of their spiritual lives. In Jeremiah chapter 8, Verses 8 and verse number 9. What does the Bible say, Brother Fleming? Read How it if can you we say How we can are wise? We say? How can we say we're wise? And the law of the Lord is with How us. How can we say that we're wise? We have the law of the Lord is with us. Read. Look, the Look. false pen of the scribe. The false pen of the scribe. Certain works, falsehood. Continue to read. They, the wise men, the wise are, ashamed. men are ashamed. They are dismayed, they are dismayed and, and taken. Behold, behold, they have rejected behold, the word of the Lord. They have rejected, sounds like America right now. They have rejected the word of the Lord. The people of Judah were so guilty what? of believing that just because they had the law of the Lord, they were under special, from, special protection from judgment. Mm -hmm. But God says they are fools and not wise because they have forsaken the word of God. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm convinced right now that our nation lives under the same delusion. We live in a nation where God has been forsaken. His commandments have been ignored and his son Jesus has been forgotten and refused by many. America is no different than ancient Judah. They were guilty of pride and so is our nation right now. Drop down to verse number 11, Brother Fleming, if you please. Drop down to verse 11. For what they have healed the hurt say? of the daughters of my people slightly. The Bible slightly. says, for they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying Saying, what? peace, peace. They said, peace, peace. When there is no when peace. When there was no peace. In other words, Judah was guilty. They were guilty of looking at the tragedies. They were suffering as a nation being just a minor bump in the road. In other words, they didn't take it seriously. They didn't take God seriously. Mm -hmm. They were guilty of putting a band-aid on a seven limb. And God was judging them, but they were clinging to the false hope that God was somehow obligated to bless them just because they were his people. You see, America is guilty of the same foolish thinking on this afternoon. Our politicians... Our politicians are busy slapping band-aids on wounds that are killing our society. They tell us that they have everything under control while the patient is bleeding out right before our very eyes. This nation is a nation wearing the blinders of self-deception. Our nation is in the midst 
of social, economical, and spiritual collapse. Yet most Americans can't see the handwriting on the wall. As I said, what we have done is we have sat back in our homes and we say, well, I don't, that, not, that doesn't bother me. We sit back in our homes and we see all this nasty stuff on TV and we say, well, I don't do that. But you have to realize that you've got granddaughters and you've got grandsons and you need to realize that they are going to be exposed to this stuff if we don't change the paradigm. We meaning the God's people. Y'all listening to me? We mean God's people. We are the ones. You see, America does not need a band-aid applied to its wounds. It needs Jesus. That's what America needs. It needs the Lord. It needs to put their hope in the Lord. America doesn't need an economic savior. America needs to place their hope in Jesus. In Jesus. That's right. That's what America needs. Look at verse 12, Brother Fleming. Read it if you please. Verse number 12. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? <laughs> Sounds like America. Were they ashamed? What did Judah say? What did they say? No. No. They were not at all ashamed. They weren't ashamed. Neither did they what? Nor did they know how to blush. We have lost our ability to blush. This verse is like a snapshot of our nation. Look at the sins that ravage our society. Drug abuse, alcohol abuse, sex, crime, pornography, and increasing ungodliness. They're the rule of the day. Individuals living together, that's, that's just become normal. That, that's, that's normal. Homosexuality has become an accepted lifestyle in America. There's no shame in our society. Just like, Duda, just like Judah, we have lost our ability to blush. Mm -hmm. Nothing bothers us anymore. We have passed laws that violate the basic fundamentals of God's creation. Are y'all following me? We have allowed men to be with men and women to be with women. We have dismantled marriage and parenthood. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. You don't mind me teaching this afternoon, do you? I came, I, I drove all this way to teach. That, that's what I, I, I came to teach Christ and him crucified. I don't, I, don't have any, I don't have any theories or any of that other junk that maybe you've been expecting. All I know is the word of God. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1 and verses 26 and 27. And let some of y'all read this for the first time. Genesis chapter 1. Then God said. Now watch, now watch this now. Then God said. Notice who said it. Who said it? God said. The president said it. God said. Congress said it. God said. The state representative said God it. God said. Folks, we need to get it right. God said it. And when God says something, we need to listen. And God said. What did he say, Brother Fleming? Let us make man Let in our own us. image. You know what? It sounds like the Godhead was present. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our own image, read. According to our, our likeness. According to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. So let them have dominion over everything swimming. Read. Over the birds of the air. Everything flying. And over, over the cattle. Over the cattle. Over all the earth. And over all the earth. Over every creeping thing. On e every creeping that thing. That creeps on the earth. Now look at verse number 27. Let's see this, some of y'all, for the first time. So God created man in his own image. So God created, notice who did it. God did it. Not mm -hmm. some scientist down at the University of Kentucky or the mm -hmm. University of Louisville. Mm -hmm. God did it. Mm -hmm. So God created man in his own image. Read. In the image of God. In the image of God. He created him. He created him. Male and female. Male and male. He cre male and female. Female and female. Male and female. Bill and Steve. Male and female. He created them. And some folks have the mitigated gall to try to run around and say, well, you know, God created me like that. And, and, and here's, what, here's what upsets me. You got some men wanting to be a woman. Why is it that you're running down to Mexico getting cut on if you want to be a woman and you popping estrogen and you talk about you a woman? Why is that? And you, why, why, do you, why would you want to do something like that? And you popping estrogen pills. Why would some man say they were born a woman and you taking testosterone if you said you were born that way? All right. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? 
See, what happened is some perverted, no good person got their hands on you at the wrong time of life and turned you into something. God did not mess you up like that. And that's what we need to teach, my brothers and sisters. God says male and female. Isn't that what the Lord says? Now, I know this sounds fundamental to a lot of y'all, but I'm going to say some things this afternoon that some of y'all are going to see this for the first time. He says, male, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 2. Male and female. You see, Adam, Adam didn't get a chance to choose his wife. Adam's, Adam's wedding, Brother Duncan, was, it was an arranged marriage. See, some of y'all don't know that. It was an arranged marriage. Adam didn't meet his wife until the day of his wedding. Now, let's see this for the first time. Look at Genesis chapter 2. You see, what God did, what God did before God put the boy to sleep, what God did was God, God had all of these animals come before Adam. God just, and God, and God didn't need Adam to name the animals, but God was trying to get the boy's head right. God started bringing all of these animals. In case I could see Adam, ooh, 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 ooh. God just started bringing them. God was trying to get the boy's head right. And I can see, God, we on the same page? Yeah, God, we on the same page. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 20, what did the Bible say? Read it if you have it. So Adam gave name to all cattle. He gave names to all the cattle. To the birds of the birds air. Birds of the air. And to every beast of the field. Uh-huh. But for Adam, there was not found a see, helper comparable to him. See, after all, after all of these animals him. start walking before Adam, I'm all, you saw all of these animals. I can see, God, you see anything you like, boy? No, sir. Are you sure? No, sir. Well, we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. Had to get the boy's head right. Yes, sir. That's it. Read verse 21. And the Lord calls a deep sleep. See, God, now, 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 after God got the boy's head right, God put him to sleep. God put the boy to sleep. God, God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. Read. And he slept. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs. And he took one of his ribs. And closed up the flesh and in his place. And closed up the flesh instead thereof. Read. Read. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man. He made into a woman. He made a man. Made him to a woman. He made a man. Made into a woman. He made a man. Made into a woman. My Bible says he made a woman mm -hmm. and brought her to the man. And when you look at the next verse, what does the next verse say? And Adam said, and Adam said this is now bone of my bone. Wait bones. a minute. Adam said, now, 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 mm -hmm. now you got it. Now, now, God, now. That's now. It. That's it. Oh, y'all, some of y'all just now, some of y'all, that went over some of you all. All right. He said, now, 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 this is now bones of my bones mm -hmm. and flesh. Of, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with a man liking what he sees. I see some of y'all are not sure. Come on. Yes, sir. See, when I first saw Annette Sanders, I liked what I saw. I was down in Lynchburg, Tennessee, yes, and, and, and I saw this young lady. I saw a set of legs, and those legs were no, no man. <laughs> those legs were no, no man. He said, this is now, 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 God, now. This is now bones of my bones. Isn't that what the Bible says? It's now bones, bones of, of my, my bones. bones and flesh of and flesh my, of flesh. my flesh. She shall be called what? She, be called, she, she shall be, be called, called woman. woman. Notice Adam is saying this. He got, God got the boy's head right. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Genesis chapter 6. What was the purpose of the ark? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about what the purpose? You see, some people, the, the purpose of the ark wasn't for Noah to take a nice cruise while everybody else was drowning. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the ark was not for Noah to have this big houseboat. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the ark is very clear. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 19, mm -hmm. Brother Fleming, if you please, what does the Bible say? Read it if you have it, Genesis chapter 6. And of six. every living thing of all flesh. Now notice, of every living thing of all flesh. You shall bring, bring two what? of every sort wait a minute, into the ark. Wait a minute, brother. Wait a minute. Hold mm -hmm. on. Wait a minute. I bring how many? Two of two what? Two of every sort wait a into minute. the ark. Wait a minute. Two? Does it have to be two? Two. 
It has to be two. Have to be two. It has to be two. Bring two. You reckon there's a law in there somewhere? You know, it's, it's kind of like Sesame Street. Two of these things are not like the other. Two of these things are not the same. Reckon there's a law there somewhere? Two of every sort. That's what the Bible says. See, some of y'all seeing this for the very first time. Two of every sort. Continue to read. Two of every sort. Two of every sort. Into the ark. To, to the ark. To keep them alive to do with what? you. To do what? To keep them alive Say it one more time. You. To, to keep, keep them, them alive, alive with you. The purpose of the ark was to keep the seed alive. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to have birds 2,000 years later, you better have a male and a female bird in that ark. If you wanted to have a T-bone or a ribeye 2,000 years later, you better have a cow and a bull on that ark. Say it, preacher. Yes, sir. Good Does teacher. that make sense? Make good sense. Two of every sort to keep them alive. So the purpose of the ark is very simple. Keep the seed alive. Because everybody else that was up on the face of the earth, they were going to be drowned. Keep the seed alive. And if you were going to keep the seed alive, it had to be two of every sort. Now, let's continue to read. Two of, keep them alive. Continue to read, Brother Fleming. They shall be what? Male and female. They shall be what? Male and female. Now, wait a minute, Brother Fleming. You know that's illegal. That's illegal. Mm -hmm. They shall be male the and female. Now, the University of Kentucky, they got professors that'll tell you that's illegal. You can't do that. Male and female. You got folk that'll tell you that's illegal. You can't do that. Well, let me tell you something. When God sets something in motion, you can't change it. Mm -hmm. Two of every sort. The Bible said they had to be male and female. Read verse number 20. Of the birds of, after their kind. Continue to read. Of animals after their kind. Continue to read. And of every creeping thing of the earth after this kind. Continue to read. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. To keep the seed. The purpose of the ark was to keep the seed alive. And on that ark it had to be two of every sort or you weren't going to have any more of them. You see, God is the author of marriage. Marriage is for those who, that marriage is for male and female, those who are mature. That's who marriage is for. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. If some of you are sitting there, well, well Brother Sanders, you've been in the New Testament, you've been in the Old Testament. Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 19. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19. And, le and let's see what Jesus said. Because some of y'all are not going to believe it unless Jesus said it. Well, I want you to believe this. In Matthew chapter 19, in verse number four, listen to what Jesus said. If you don't want to believe what God said, listen to what Jesus said. And in Matthew's gospel, and chapter 19, them, and he answered and said unto them, what? Have you not read? In other words, Jesus said, oh, wait a minute. In beginning. other words, Jesus said, don't y'all read? Don't y'all read? Have you not read? Read, Brother Fleming. That who, he who made them who, at who the made beginning. Them at the, wait, wait a minute. He who made them at the beginning. Who made them at the beginning? God made them. Mm. How did he make them? Male, Male and, female. and female. Why in the world you got folk in society who have PhDs that are trying to change the very thing that God put in motion? Mm. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I'm, I'm not done yet. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse number 24. Romans chapter 2. So we need to see this because we need to be teaching our young men. And that, that's what I said this morning. You got a young man, you don't let him start looking like a ballerina. You don't let him start twitching around like a ballerina. You make sure he's a man. Make sure he grows up a man. You make sure, one thing I've always known, I, I've always loved women. I know the difference between a male and a female. Yes, sir. And you need to make sure, that's one thing, my, my parents weren't perfect, but my dad, he taught me the difference between a man and a woman. In Romans chapter 1, Brother Fleming, look at verse number 24. The first part of verse number 24. What does the Bible say? Read it if Therefore, you have it. Therefore, God gave, also gave them up God to uncleanliness. God gave them up to uncleanness. In the lust of their hearts. Now, no fire came down from heaven to strike them down. Man was left to the desires of his heart. Man chooses to sin over God because sin is bound up in his heart. It's a choice. 
What I'm saying is this stuff is a choice. You don't let anybody tell you they were born that way. Why is, why, why is it that God is going to create something and that goes against his law? That's foolishness. And when we sit back and take it and, and say, well, you know, Brother Sanders, they may have a point. You need to stop that stuff. You need to stop that stuff. They don't have a point because what you say will not override what the Lord says. That's it, preacher. Look at verse 25. Who had changed the truth of God for the lie. See, that's what's going on right now in our country. Our politicians are changing the truth of God into a lie. Changing the truth of God into a lie. Continue to read. And worshiped and served the cre worshiping creature. Worshiping and serving the creature. Rather than the creator. More than the creator. Since man refuses to live by God's law, he invents his own law. And the result is that man also invents his own God. The chief God usually being self. God calls this behavior the exchange of truth for a lie. Man trades that which is living, helpful, and vital for that which is dead, harmful, and vain. Mm -hmm. Because man has chosen his sin over God, man is given over to vile affections. Mm -hmm. Vile. Some stuff is just vile. Just vile. You understand what I'm saying? I want to make, make it graphic for you. It's just vile. But we sit back and we take it and we say, oh, yeah, done, uh, yeah. We, we need to look at this thing more seriously. It is permeating our society. It's hurting families. It's hurting children. It's already coming into schools. Amen. You got children in the, in the schoolyard, in the back of the school, two boys kissing in the back of the schoolyard. Yes, two girls in the back of the schoolyard. Folks, this is hurting our society. And we need to get back and building our hope on where it needs to be, and that's in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Read verse 26, Brother Fleming. For this reason, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. Vile passions. Read. For even their women exchanged the natural use. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait. The women, yes, vile, women change the natural use. You see, a male and a female it's natural. That's natural. Like I say, when I met when I met Sister Sanders, I like what I saw. But see, God put that innately in me. I'm supposed to like a female in that way. There's nothing wrong with that. When you saw Sister Ann, did you like what you see? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll answer for him. He did. He liked what he saw. <laughs> he liked what he saw. But see, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. But the Bible said they changed the natural use. Continue to read, Brother Fleming. For what is against nature, likewise also the men see, <laughs> leave the natural use of the woman. See, when I leave the natural use of a woman, <laughs> that's vile. How, how do you make that work? And I don't even want to think about how you make that work. <laughs> that's vile. Continue to read. Burn in their lust one for the other. Read. Men with men. Yeah. Committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. You see, the sad thing for us is that homosexuality, the community in America, what they're doing is they're promoting their lifestyle and open, demanding that you and I endorse them and accept them and affirm what they are doing is okay. Well, y'all, you know, y'all just, y'all are bullies. Y'all just bullies. And down at the University of Memphis right now, Brother Fleming, they have what they call safe zones. So if Steve and Bill want to kiss, they, got, they, they can go in a safe zone and kiss and hold hands. And that's being paid for by their taxpayer dollars. Now, I don't know what other campus has it, but the University of Memphis has it because Brother DeBerry told me. And you have other campuses that have this type of stuff. So if Steve and Bill want to want to hold hands, they can hold hands without being bullied. Y'all, y'all bully us. Y'all, y'all just bully. Folks, we have to realize that the battle cry today is for tolerance. If God doesn't like it, you're not supposed to like it. I'm not being a bully. God, why do you think that I'm supposed to like it just under the auspices of I'm going to be tolerant? No, I will not be tolerant of something that the Lord is not tolerant of. My brothers and my sisters, my brothers and my sisters, we, there are some things that, there are some other things that you need to know. There are some other things you need to know. There is a holocaust 
in America. There's a holy cause so shameful and so horrendous and so heartless that it defiles the actions of Pharaoh who killed little children and Herod who killed little children. Oh, there's a holocaust in America where children are declared not human. Where you have a human male and a human female do that which is natural. How can they bring forth something that is not human? But in a nation that has removed the rules, taken away God, closed the Bible, changed the principles, moved the biblical standards of morality, you can make anything work in a reprobate mind. We need to open our eyes and see this holy cost in America where millions of young children are killed every year. We protect the trouts and the dogs. And the cats. Y'all understand what I'm saying? You got horse barns up and down 64 that look like houses. All kinds of societies, they protect the animals, but children are snatched from their mother's womb, which ought to be the safest place on this earth. And they're placed in bags and thrown away like human garbage, are cut up to be experimented on for stem cell research, and other dehumanizing and demoralizing things that are done to the corpses of little unborn babies. Oh, there's a holocaust in America. Turn to Job chapter 3 and verse 3. Job chapter 3 and verse 3. Job chapter 3 and verse number 3. I want you to listen to what Job said. And I want this to stick with you. I'm, I'm, see, what I want to do, I want to give you something that's going to stick to your ribs. I'm not a Kool-Aid gospel preacher. I want to give you something that's going to stick to your ribs, something that's going to help you, something that I want you to think about. In Job chapter 3 and verse 3, what did the Bible say? May the day perish, May the day perish on which I was born. On which I was and born. And the night in which and it was said. And the night said, in which it was said. What was said? A male said? child what kind, is conceived. A what kind of child? A male child, a what kind of child? is received. A male conceived. child. At the moment of conception, that child is a human being. Mm. That child is a person. Mm. At the moment of Job's conception, even though he was too small to be seen by the naked eye, God knew him and he was a man and he was conceived a man. Job was not conceived a zygote or a fetus. From conception to birth, God uses one word, and that word is child. And if you are in any way indifferent on this issue, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home and Google silent scream. Silent scream. I want you to go home if you're in any way indifferent on this, on this issue, and I want you to watch as the child that's in his mother's womb tries to dodge and move around the instrument that is trying to snatch him from his mother's womb. You can see the pain and anguish on this little unborn child's face when they grab his legs and begin to pull his body apart and pull him from his mother's womb. Turn to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Isaiah chapter 7, and verse See, I told you, we need to build our hope. We need to get our hope back where it needs to be. This nation needs to return back to God. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14, the Bible said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Mm -hmm. Behold what, Brother Fleming? The who? The virgin the shall virgin. conceive. A virgin shall conceive. And bear a son. Notice, a virgin shall conceive and bear a who? A son. And bear a son, read. And he shall call his name Emmanuel. He, he was conceived and born, and his name was given before he was even born. Mm -hmm. If a woman who is with a child has a head-on collision with an individual who is intoxicated, and the woman and the child are both killed, isn't it ironic that they will accuse the driver of two deaths? Mm -hmm. But you've got doctors all over this country killing children every day, and it's okay. Do you see how we can make stuff fit where we want to make it fit? We call righteousness evil, and we call evil righteousness. October 5th, today my life began. My parents did not know it yet, but I'm as small as an apple seed, 
October 19th. I've grown a little, but I'm still too small to do anything for myself. But my mother does everything for me. Some say that I'm not a real person, yet, yet that only my mother exists. But I'm a real person. November 2nd. I am growing a little bit every day. My arms and legs are beginning to take shape. Even if I were born deformed without arms and legs, I could have artificial arms and legs like grown people do sometimes. November 20th, it wasn't until today that the doctor told my mama that I'm living under her heart. She's helping me so much already. She's even feeding me with her own blood. My mama's so good. December 10th, my hair is growing smooth and it is shiny. I wonder what kind of hair my mother has. December 17th, I'm just about able to see now. It's dark all around me, but when my mother brings me into the world, it will be full of sunshine and flowers. I've never seen a flower, but what I want to see most of anything else is my mama. How do you look, mama? December 24th, I wonder if mama hears the whispering heartbeat of my heart. Some children come into this world a little bit sick, and then the delicate hands of the doctor perform miracles to bring them back to health. But my heart is strong, and I'm healthy. You will have a healthy little daughter, Mama. December 28th, today my mama killed me. God has blessed America in the years that have, that have gone by. Time and again, God has proven those blessings on this nation by economic prosperity and peace. We have been blessed. But the tide has turned in recent decades because America as a nation has abandoned God. They've abandoned the Lord in biblical principles. I don't want to end this message on a somber note. I want you to know that I still believe there's hope for America. I still believe that God can stop our slide into paganism. Do you all believe that? The only way this will happen is for America to heed an ancient warning. When Israel sinned against God, judgment was the result. God's word to them in the day of their sin is the same word America must heed today if she expects to survive. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, repent, and seek God's face. And that's what needs to happen in America right now. America must bow to God Almighty. America must repent of their sins and embrace the Lord Jesus as its only hope of salvation. America will change when its citizens change. If you're lost and you're not a member of the Lord's church, you need to come to the Lord for salvation. If you're a child of God, you need to search your own heart to be sure that your sins have been dealt with according to God's word. You need to do everything in your power to see that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is carried to a dying and criticizing world. I've said a lot of things on this afternoon, but I hope that I've shaken you up and caused you to think. And that's the objective, to make you think, to get us to see where we are as a country and to help us see as God's people that we need to put our hope in Jesus and not in society. It's not about who's in the White House or the State House. It's about who's in heaven. Because that's where my headquarters is. My, I tell folks, folks ask me, well, well, where is your headquarters? Where is your headquarters? I say, it's in heaven. And they look at me funny. I say, well, doesn't the head normally reside at the headquarters? In Charlotte, North Carolina, Bank of America is the headquarters for Bank of America. The head resides in Charlotte because that's where the headquarters is. Our headquarters is in heaven. Our head resides at the headquarters. And in case you forgot, his name's Jesus. And that's where my hope is, and that's where yours should be. And I pray this week we can preach messages that will help us look at ourselves and help us say, you know what? I'm going to place my hope in Jesus and nothing else. Because nothing else is going to save me like Jesus. Nobody's going to be a friend to me like Jesus a nation that needs to return back to the Lord. If you're not a member of the Lord's church, you can become a member. You've heard his word. Do you believe his word with all of your heart? Will you repent of your sins? Will you confess the greatest name on mortal tongue?
And upon that confession, we'll baptize you right now, Father, in mission of your sins. If you're a child of God, and maybe you've been slack, slothful, and indifferent, it's not the end of the world. We all sin, and we all fall short. When you mess up, you fess up. Fess up. God will forgive you. Well, Brother Sanders, people in the church won't forgive me. You don't worry about that. You don't have to stand before people. As long as God has forgiven you, and first of all, as long as you have repented, God will forgive you. And that's all you need to worry about. You have to stand before the Lord, not Brother Fleming, not myself, not the elders. You stand before the Lord, and you're going to give account of your stewardship. Think about that. Let us stand.